Romans 8, we shall read from verse 31 all the way to the end of the chapter. Please hear the word of God. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any church against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate, uh, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, no things present, no things to come. No powers, no height, no depth, no anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, what words of love to hear that before the judgment seat of Christ, no church, no condemnation. There is justification. And in all eternity, we will never be separated from your love. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We rejoice that such are the promises that you have given us. This morning, we relish the reality of this promises in our own lives. Open up our ears to hear, Lord. Give us the heart to perceive and to receive. Bless us, O oh Lord. Grant that none will be dull of hearing these wonderful truths as they are taught from your word. Please hear us, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, this last week, Jonathan Kyoko went to be with the Lord. He's a brother who has been a member of this church for the last 27 years. He perhaps sat in the seat that you are seated on. But he's not breathing the air that we breathe right now. One day, you shall die. One day we shall be talking about you in the past tense. Me too. One day, if you will not have died, Christ Jesus shall descend from heaven with a glory, with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the Bible says those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then all the dead shall be raised from the dead. The dead in Christ will rise first then we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what we've done in the body, whether good or evil. Those who have done evil will be condemned to the resurrection of judgment in eternal hell or fire. But those who will have done good in Christ will be raised to the resurrection of life in the glories of heaven 
in the presence of God forever. There is no alternative. There is no alternative. The verses before us remind us of that eternal appointment which no one will ignore. When that yonder will be called, when we will be summoned into God's court, we all must have to hear the verdict and go to the destiny that God has appointed for each one of us. Now, let me tell you that there are charges against each one of us because of our sins. There is no one who does not have a church sheet before God. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None is righteous. No, not one. We've all turned astray. No one does good. No, not one. And so then, if that church will be presented, everyone will be found guilty. No one will be able to say, I did not sin. I did not break your law. When that day comes, the question is, will your sins be upon you or will they be upon someone else? Will you have to defend yourself or will you have an advocate? Now, if you do not have an advocate with the Father right now, Jesus Christ the righteous, it's bad news for you. Because after the church sheet is read for you, you will be declared guilty and you will be condemned. Condemned forever. Condemned to hell forever. But the reason why God brought you to church today is so that you will not be declared guilty and be condemned on that day. Because this passage presents us with very good news. That a sinner can be justified. A sinner can be declared righteous. And so the message this morning is that it is God who justifies. Not man. Not the preacher. Not your parents. Your parents can read the Bible for you. They can pray for you. They can bring you to church. They can catechize you. They can make every effort for you. But it is God who justifies. Your parents cannot justify. I've met with many Kenyans whom you ask, are you a Christian? Yes. What church? I thank God that I have retained the church of my parents. And they think that they have the faith of their father and their mother. And they think then that they will be justified because of their faithfulness in retaining the faith of their parents. And perhaps you also lived like that for a long time. Perhaps there are children here, been born, raised in this church, who are thinking like that. We go to a good church. And that's it. They think that that's enough. It is God who justifies. You may have the best parents in the world, and they may have the faith to move mountains. You may listen to the best preaching in the world, but it is God who justifies, and unless you understand that statement of fact and plead for God's mercy through his Son, it's going to be bad news for you. 
There are two questions here. Who shall bring in a church against God's elect? The second question is, who is to condemn? This is to demonstrate that it is God who justifies. Who shall bring in a church against God's elect? The question is not suggesting that there is none who might attempt to bring churches against God's elect. You well know that your own conscience accuses you, doesn't it? And you know that the world ever points fingers accusing. And you know the accuser of brethren, the devil, he is ever accusing. But the question is, who shall bring any church against God's elect successively? Or who shall be justified to bring any church against God's elect? That's a question. So the verse, uh, the verse asks this all-important question, who shall bring any church against God's elect? Who shall dare to bring any church of any sort against any of God's elect? Now, what's the answer to that question? What's the answer to that question? Yes? None. It's not none shall dare, but it's none shall be successful. Why none? For really, the only person who can justly bring charges against God's elect is, is who? Yes? Who? God himself. Thank you. The only one who would be justified in bringing any charges against God's elect is God himself because we have sinned against God. We broke God's law. So if anyone is to charge us with transgression, then it is God. It is God who is angry because of our sins. It is God who has a legal right to condemn us. It is God who has been offended, having been sinned against, and his law broken. But thanks be to God. For the verse says that God will not bring any charge against his own elect. And the reason, the two reasons why we answer that there is none who shall bring any charge against God's elect? There are two reasons are given. First of all, it's because of our identity. We are called here God's elect. And then the second reason is because of our it's because of God's verdict. God's elect. What does that mean? We are going to spend the whole of chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 trying to answer that question as to who is God's elect. But I want to give you a very condensed understanding of who God's elect are. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, we are told that God chose you. In him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him. Goes on to say, in love, he predestined us. So God chose us. God, out of his mere good pleasure, 
chose us. God, out of his love, God, out of his grace, chose us. And God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's when it happened, before the foundation of the world. And so being elect of God, or being God's elect, means that God made us his own choice. So every Christian is one who has been loved by God's everlasting love and has been given to his son, Jesus Christ. Christians, do you notice your identity? What is your identity? You are God's elect. Christians are God's elect and nothing, nothing, nothing can change that identity. No one can take us out of God's electing love. None can sever is what we've just sung. What an exalted possession that is to be identified by God as God's elect. God is in the genitive, possessive, showing the elect are of God. They belong to God. They don't belong to the world. We belong to God as his elect, and therefore God cannot bring any charge against his own. God, having charged his son, all we owned him, it was necessary then to identify and specify that we belong to him. To specify the persons who are not going to be charged. But you realize that when the Bible says that there is such a group as God's elect, it means that the charge sheet is not that it has been withdrawn, is that it has been it has been satisfied. But there is another group whose charge sheets are still pending. They are still pending. The verdict is guilty. But it doesn't have to be because for you to cross from this side to this side, for your charge sheet to be taken from the left and be brought to the right, Don't need to do anything. It is grace. It is God's love. It is God, God's mere good pleasure. And if you're hearing this message, there is no reason why your charge sheet should remain on this side of the tray. You need to come here. You need to come here today. Speaking of the elect, the Bible says that even the days of tribulation will be shortened for the sake of the elect. Matthew 24, verse 22. Paul was a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, he tells Titus. Titus 1, 1. And Peter recounts this elect and he says that they are elect according to to the foreknowledge of God, their Father. And so the elect are precious to the Lord, for it is, as, it, it is His own. They are His own. And God sent His Son for these people. And the second, the second reason is that the reason why no charge shall be brought against you is because the verdict has been given. And what's the verdict? What is God's verdict? It is God who justifies. Your charge sheet 
has not just been taken here to here without stamping. It has been stamped. And what's the stamp? what does the stamp say? Justified. God's elect, justified. The verdict has been given. God, not man, is the author of justification. You know, this is not like someone came and, uh, you know, the, the registrar came and in a very sly way withdrew one sheet, you know, and, and, and took the stamp from the judge and he has stamped it without going through the judge. No, the judge is God and what has he done? He took out the judge sheet himself, looked at it, read God's elect and, and stamped and put it there. Who is the judge in the courtroom of God? It is God. Who has justified us in the courtroom of God? It is God. If God the judge has justified us, then he has dropped all the charges. He has put them down. All the charges against us have been brought down. We are acquitted. We are declared righteous. We are justified by God. God is the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So then I ask you, do you think when God justifies and he places the, that person in the position of eternal security in his redemption plan, can again come and look at those sheets again and say, well, this guy, we need to look at this file again. Is he going to do that? No. None who has been justified by God will be recorded. He will not record the burden of his love. Justification means that one's sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And Christ's righteousness has been imputed, has been credited, has been given freely. And once the righteousness of Christ has been credited to your account, it cannot be recalled. It cannot be withdrawn. It cannot be annulled. By who? By who? All those who have been justified are forever declared righteous on the account of Christ's merit of righteousness. Because those who are justified are those who were effectually called to salvation by the Spirit in his word. And those so called, who are those? They were in eternity foreknown and predestined to the glory, uh, to, to, the glory to be revealed. But how would you know? How would you know? If indeed this righteousness is yours, how would you know? How would you know whether you've been declared righteous or not? How would you know if you're God's elect? Is it possible to know? Yes? Paul knew that the Thessalonian church had been chosen by God because the gospel came to them not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. What does that mean? You can know if you are elect of God. You can know if you are justified. You can know by the way you receive the word of God. The way you receive the word of God. What does it do to your heart? Is there any conviction? Or you just listen, 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 go home.
so many people go to church on a Sunday morning like today, now noon. They see the pastor opening up his mouth and closing and having words and words and words and then they go home. That's all they hear. The pastor talked and talked and talked and talked. That's the way pastors talk. Go home. Day in, day out, they go to church. They hear the pastor talking and talking and they go home. Over and over again. It doesn't make any sense to them. There is no meaning to those words. It's just hearing someone's upon someone's. They don't ask themselves, what has those words to do with my soul? What are those words to do with my eternal destiny? We know that God has chosen you by the way you receive the word of God. We know. We know. If you do not tremble at the word of God, then why should I believe that you are elect of God? The elect of God will listen to the word of God. The elect of God will be attentive to hear the word of God. They will. They cannot, they cannot do otherwise. The reception of the word of God by faith and with humility and conviction is the way to know that you are the elect of God. God's elect believe God's word. God's elect believe God's son. God's elect believe and they live accordingly. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? God will not do it because of your because of your position, because of your identity. What's your identity? God's elect. God will not bring any charge against you because of his own verdict. What is his verdict? Justified. Amen. If that's all you will hear today, I can even die. Yes. If you will understand that, you're good. And I'm good too. But I know you want to ask the question, who is to condemn? Well, let's deal with this matter and take away all the doubt. Who is to condemn? Let's consider the options. Who is to condemn? And after, immediately after asking the question, the verse provides the, these answers. Is it Jesus? Could, could it be Jesus? No, because Jesus died. Oh, more than that, Jesus was raised. More than that, Jesus is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So you are completely mistaken. Jesus will not condemn you. You realize that that question comes with this understanding that the one who could condemn is Jesus, Christ Jesus. But the verse makes it absolutely clear that even though Christ Jesus as the judge could possibly condemn, but wait. Christ will not condemn because he has decisively dealt with our problem. How? And the apostle then provides four grounds for our security. Four grounds. He says, number one, Christ died. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He died our death. Remember that cross of Calvary? He died that death 
not for his own sins, but he died as our substitute. He died a vicarious death. He died the, to, to pay the penalty due to us for our sins. He died in order that we may live. He died to deliver us from the punishment due to us for our sins. Because the wages of sin is death. The soul who sins shall die. But the soul who died had not sinned. So the soul who ought to die trusting in Christ does not die. He died to deliver us because he died our death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Christ died, there is no sin and atoned for. Because Christ died, no stain and washed. Because Christ died, no precept of the law and kept. His death brought us justification. And therefore, there is now no one who can lay any church, any just church against me, against you, God's elect. Christ is the one who died. Christ died to pay the penalty. And he paid the full penalty for us. Christ died to pay the ransom, the full ransom for us. And now we are redeemed. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Based on this complete atonement by his death in Golgotha, all who embrace Christ by faith are free from sin, free from guilt, free, free from its power, from, from the power of sin, free from the condemnation of sin. And now I can sing, Bold shall I start in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absorbed through this I am from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. And I can sing, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt. Oh, in all my pride. We therefore sing the praise of him who died. Of him who died upon the cross. The sinner's hope let men deride. For this we count the world but loss. Inscribed upon the cross. We see in shining letters. God is love. He bears our sins upon the tree. He brings us mercy from above. The cross, it takes our guilt away. Guilt away. The cross, it holds the fainting spirit up. The cross, it cheers with hope that gloomy day of death and sweetens every bitter cup. The cross, it makes the coward spirit brave and nerves the feeble arm for fight. The cross, it takes the terror from the grave and gilds the bed of death with light. Therefore, the death of Christ is the balm of life. The death of Christ is a cure of woe. The death of Christ is a measure and the plunge of God's love for us. The death of Christ is the sinner's refuge here below. And it is the angel's theme in heaven above. Amen. But that's not the only ground for our security. The second ground for our security is, on the third day he was raised according, in accordance to the scriptures. He was raised. Death is not the end. 
because he was raised from the dead on the that day in accordance with the scriptures. He appeared to those who were near and dear and fair. He conquered death and destroyed the portals of death. He was raised. He arose from the dead on the then day as preached in the gospel. His resurrection was by the power of the Spirit. He was made alive as it, it triumphed over sin and death. The Holy One did not see corruption. The Lord of glory is risen indeed. And justice has no more. Mercy and truth are now agreed. That's exactly what the prophet said. Prophet Hosea said in Hosea chapter 6 verse 2, after two days he will revive us and on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. And the Bible says for just as Jonah, this is the Lord himself, just as Jonah was Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, verse 40. And again the Lord says, When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Yes. Jesus died on that Roman cross in Calvary. Yes, the Lord was buried in a borrowed grave of Joseph. But the Lord did not remain in that grave. He did not need it forever. Because after three days early, on a Sunday morning, the Lord was raised from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. If Christ had not been raised... If Christ had not been raised, then all our preaching is a noisy gong. It's a clanging symbol. And you can get tired with me preaching if Christ had not been raised. Because the Bible says if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain and futile. And you are still in your sins. We are, of all people, most to be pated. But the Bible says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Christ, our Savior, is raised from the dead. Hallelujah. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, then it must be it must have been because a sacrifice had not been accepted. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, then it means that our sins have not been atoned for. In which case, we would be in our sins and unsaved. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, then redemption had not been accomplished. His resurrection is the proof of his victory over sin. His resurrection is the proof of his victory over the world. His resurrection is the proof of his victory over the law. His resurrection is the proof of his victory over the devil. His resurrection is the proof of his victory over death itself. So the last enemy has been conquered. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, death, where is thy victory? Christ Jesus has killed death by his own death. Hallelujah. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And all the obligation of sin upon us is abolished. For he was raised for our justification. Remember Romans 4.25. His resurrection is our own resurrection. Now the good news is proclaimed. 
Oh, this is what he told his disciples in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 45 to 49. He said, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins shall be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am setting the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Two grounds for our security. One, Christ died. But more than that, Christ, Christ was raised. You realize that ground number one and ground number two for our security are all in the past. You notice that? Yes? These are in the past. These, these are historical facts that cannot be changed. But now listen to the present ground for our security. It is that Christ is. It's not was. Christ is. Where? Christ is at the right hand of God. He is now, right now, as we are talking, right now. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What does that mean? I can tell you what it doesn't mean by giving you an illustration. Yesterday evening, my wife requested our daughter Ruth to bring us seats outside. And uh, two seats were brought. I was already seated on one seat, and she came and put another seat to my left. And I made a joke about being seated to the right hand. So Ruth quickly removed the seat and brought it to my right hand. Now, my wife wasn't there then. When she came, she pulled out the seat and put it in front of me. She didn't have this theology correct. It's not like that. To be seated at God's right hand means to be given the highest exalted position there is. It is to be given the highest favors that exist. To be at the right hand of God is to be in the most exalted place. L listen to Acts chapter 2 verse 33. This is Peter preaching. And this is what he says. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. What is that? What is Christ doing at the right hand of God? This is an imagery taken from the royal favors of a king upon another, to take a place next to them or next to him. It means that Christ Jesus is reigning. He is reigning. He is ruling. He is reigning as our prophet, priest, and king forever. He is in the most favored place for our benefit. He is a victor. He is a man, a real man with wounds gaping wide from which rich streams of blood once ran in hands and feet and signed. Having done and accomplished his work of redemption, the Lord is sitting at the most exalted place, the right heart of God. 
Unlike the Levitical priests who could never sit down at the Holy of Holies, since their imperfect work was never completed, the right hand of the majesty where our Savior sits is a place where he sits having offered the best sacrifice, a sacrifice of himself, that shows that his work of redemption is done. Tetelestai. Finished. Completed. The Lord did not only die, but rose from the dead. But the Lord did not only rise from the dead, but he has also been exalted in heaven at the best place, having been given a name that is above all other names, so that at his name every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has been highly exalted and has been given a name that is above every name. Amen? The last ground for our security before God so that there would be no condemnation is this fact. He is interceding for us. He is not seated passively doing nothing for us. He is interceding for us. He is interceding on our behalf. He wills our welfare. He requests for the very best of us. He's not bending his knee doing this. He is where? Where is he? Being co-equal with God. The intercession of Christ at the right hand of God is, is the fourth ground of our security. And this is the second act of his priestly work, the first being his sacrifice. His intercession involves the perpetual application which he makes to the Father in the name of his church of the blood which is shed on the cross for the salvation of his elect, the church. While his priestly work on earth was an act of humiliation, his priestly work in heaven of intercession is an infinitely highly exalted position. He presents his blood to God as a proof that our needs, our sins, our failures, our law-breaking is all paid for. The penalty paid is enough. The ransom paid suffices. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Therefore, the Lord is able to save us by his life, by which all law-breaking was addressed. He is able to save us by his death in which all our sins were atoned for. He is able to save us by his intercession and we are made acceptable to God. He is able to save us to the uttermost, to the uttermost. There's no part of us which is left and undressed. For he sent his spirit to apply his work of redemption to us and to make us willing in the day of his power. So the Spirit gives us a faith to trust in Christ. Trust in this Lord. Yet there are unsaved people in this room. Redemption is accomplished by the people here who are still in their unbelief. They have a reason to delay their salvation. Well, they say, 
You don't understand the evil of my sins. You don't understand the evil, the wickedness, how much I've broken God's law. But I tell you this. The Bible says the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If you confess your sins, though your sins go back to Adam, running through all your ancestors, though they spread out like the Pacific Ocean, yet the Lord will cleanse from all sin, all unrighteousness. Though your sins may be as heavy as lead or as red as crimson, yet the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from all sin, all sin, all sin, past, present, future sin. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So then, come, every soul by sin oppressed, there is mercy in the Lord. He will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. For Jesus shed his blood. He shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now, now, into the crimson flood that washes white as, as snow. Come, guilt souls. Flee away to Christ. He is the city of refuge. And heal your wounds. This is the welcome gospel day wherein free grace abounds. See, God's love for his elect and giving his son to drink the full wrath, the full cup of his wrath and give eternal life. Come to him today. Come to him today. Let me very quickly repeat what I have said by saying this. Number one, the charge sheet, where is it? It is stamped, justified, and where is it? No charges. <clears throat> By the way, this is, not, this is not like the case where our dear Fred, prosecutor Haji, would just arbitrarily drop cases because of some political influence. Now, this is, this is satisfied. God will not admit any charge against his own elect because he's our justifier. And Christ would not condemn his elect because he has paid every debt. So all the legal demands of the law have been satisfied. You see, in the first place, your charges were not politically motivated. Right? You are deceived. And so when you hear that the charges have been dropped, they've been permanently dropped. All the legal demands of the law have been met. All our debt has been erased. So then we, we do sing to one another and say, Come then, repenting sinner, come, approach with humble faith. Even if your debt of sin is how great, you will be forgiven and be declared righteous, justified. We, we sing, rejoice, believer in the Lord, for he has made your cause his own. You need not be afraid, believer. You need not fret. You need not doubt. Only believe and leave. Because you know who you are? You're God's elect. That's your position. That's your identity. You belong to him as the dearest. You need not, you need not fret at the onslaught of the evil one. 
When those fiery darts come, you need not worry about your future. They cannot take you down. Your future is in his hand. Your future is firmly secure, established by his universe creating word, established by his power. And his promises are firm and secure. And then lastly, so no charges, and then lastly, no condemnation. You're secure in Christ. No more fear. No more anxiety. No more doubts. No more uncertainties. The blood of Jesus. Oh, how sweet it sounds to cleanse and heal the sinner's wounds. No elect of God will come to glory with a single wood. All the scars inflicted by the enemies of God will be fully healed as we approach the glories of heaven. The Lord who was made as a new creation in Christ Jesus will make us glorious beings in his eternal glory. Our eternal dwelling is with God who has dealt with us so graciously. We shall be forever with the Lord. And Lord will not have to intercede for those who are away from his presence in glory. Then there will be that wonderful, blessed, eternal fellowship with God, rejoicing in his goodness and celebrating his love and praising him with immortal praises forever and ever. Amen.